So, why do you care about this election? My name is Yvette. I hope that they will put some more importance on the effect of cannabis in combination with alcohol. My name is Lee Seaman, keeping taxes down, but at the same time we have a social consciousness in the city, we have to look out to the homeless. My name is Jerome. One thing that I really care about is what everybody's talking about, the, war, um, the gun violence. My name is Hyacinth Thompson from North York. My biggest concern for the election is for youth employment. Spend some money on paint and paint better markings on the road. Oh yeah, I have a driving school. <laughs> my name is Dave Doyen, I'm from Scarborough and my biggest election issue is transit. Hi, my name is Sophia and I care about immigration rights in the upcoming election. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Glover and I'll be your guide through the 2018 city election in Toronto and across the GTA. We are coming at you live on social media like never before. We are broadcasting on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube and on our website as well. And you're probably used to seeing me live at our studios on Front Street, but tonight we are broadcasting live from Twitter headquarters, which will put us in a unique position to be able to analyze what's happening tonight, the conversation that happens tonight in real time like no one else can. So we want you to be a part of our coverage tonight. We want you to log on, be a part of this, pose questions, post comments. We can even get some of those comments and questions to the candidates who are out in the communities because we have reporters all across the city. And uh, we're also, of course, gonna be focusing on the results tonight, the hits, the misses, and everything in between. So strap in and follow along with us, but please definitely do engage with us as well. So since we are here at Twitter Canada, let's bring in Twitter Canada representative tonight, Christopher Doyle. Christopher, thank you so much for having us here. Appreciate that. And for being a part of our coverage tonight. Uh, you've been crunching the numbers for uh, this election over the past few weeks. And one thing is very clear when you see what happens online, and that is that John Tory has a whole lot of social action. Yeah, that's right, Chris. You know, John Tory has 42% more mentions than Jennifer Keysmat in this election campaign. And, you know, he started with a head start, though. He has 270,000 followers on Twitter to Keysmat's 75,000. And as you said, when we, our team crunches the data, and we've crunched the data for the entire year so far, 2018, on our platform on Twitter, the most discussed mayor across the country, John Tory, number one, beating out uh, Montreal and Ottawa coming in second and third. Mm, interesting. And you've also been able to look at what topics people have been talking about the most during this campaign online. What can you tell? I know that normally there are pretty standard uh, lists when it comes to issues that motivate people to the polls on election night in a city election. But this year is a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah, it's a really engaged audience base on Twitter this year. We're actually seeing 12 percent increase in conversation around this election more than uh, 2016 and 2017 combined. And what are they talking about, Chris? They're talking about public safety. That was the most discussed uh, topic on, on Twitter uh, leading up to this election. They're talking about infrastructure and they're talking about transportation. So those are the three big topics that we saw. Of course, all of those were seemingly trumped on June 27th. That's a date where we saw a huge spike in Twitter conversation. And that was the day that the premier decided that he was gonna announce that he's gonna shrink council. Uh, so that obviously took over in terms of, we were talking about issues that people are talking about. Yeah, that trumped the conversation online. It certainly trumped the conversation in news media as well. A lot of people were talking about that, and I bet that will come up more than a few times tonight if it is something that you're thinking about as you headed to the polls earlier today, or if it's something that you want to talk about tonight, please engage with us. You can bring it up on any of the social media platforms that we're on tonight, and we will uh, discuss all of this. Of course, up for discussion tonight will not just be those issues, but it's also what brought you out to the polls, or perhaps what made you stay at home? All of that is up for discussion. And Julia Whalen, a producer at CBC, will be here with me throughout the night. She's my co-pilot, as it were, and she uh, will have all of that discussion online. Julia, what's some of the first things that people are saying now that we're just about 10 minutes away from the polls closing? That's right, Chris. Well, first of all, we launched our first poll on, uh, on Twitter. Very simple question, did you vote today? If so, let us know why. We've received 504 votes so far. Uh, and right now, some of the most uh, enlightening responses we've uh, received, one from Sasha Carter. She says, I'm too young, but I will vote for sure when I'm of age. 
another one from Bev. Sadly, this isn't about municipal politics anymore. It's all about which party you support. Doug Ford made it clear when he interfered with Toronto's municipal seats. And finally, from Biebs, she says, because it is my right. People around the world fight and die for the right that is ours without much effort. We should all remember that. It's really simple for us and there's no excuse. So we encourage you, uh, if you have any questions throughout the night, to tweet at us, get us on Facebook or Twitter. All of these polls we'll be bringing live to you and I have two colleagues taking, uh, taking a look at Facebook and YouTube for us. So we'll be sure to answer your questions. All right, full team coverage for sure. And Julia, one other point as well is that there are already problems that have been reported in uh, Pickering, for example. What That's can you tell us about that? That's right. So uh, just seeing a, a little bit of reaction about that on Twitter, uh, Ken Beecham says, this is absolutely in shambles. My wife and I have not been able to vote for 56 minutes and their system is a disaster. Still not able to vote. Absolutely ridiculous. So a lot of frustration coming from there too, Chris. Wow. Okay. And the city of Pickering just tweeted out a couple minutes ago that they have extended hours to vote until 10 o'clock. So that's important news to know if you are joining us tonight from Pickering as well. Um, one thing that we are going to be following very closely tonight, in addition to the conversation online, of course, is also the results. And one race here in the city of Toronto is catching a lot of attention. Of course, that's the Toronto mayoral race and John Tory seeking re-election tonight. I want to introduce you now to Lauren Pelly, our City Hall reporter. Uh, you probably know Lauren's face quite well. She's always talking about this kind of stuff. And tonight she is at John Tory's campaign headquarters, which is at the Sheridan, just across the street from City Hall. And Lauren, I know that space well. It is a big space, and I bet that signals that John Tory expects to be having a big party tonight. And that already seems to be the case. It's filling up here in this suite. You can see that the TVs are on behind me and the podium is set up there for John Tory, who I imagine is hoping to give a victory speech there tonight uh, with a second term in office. Now, he has been leading in the polls, so I imagine many supporters here think it's good news to see those results coming in a little later. Uh, now. Tory has positioned himself as someone who's going to keep the status quo in Toronto. He said that he's done what he said he would do in his first four years, and he wants to keep up that momentum. He's called himself someone who's brought stability back to City Hall, and he's been able to collaborate with higher levels of government. There'll be many challenges, obviously, for Tory if he is re-elected for a second term. But, you know, it's been an interesting ride for him in the campaign trail so far already. I want to bring in Vince Gasparo right now, uh, Tory's co-chair on the campaign. And, and Vince, I just want to ask you, you know, there was one big name, Jennifer Keysmatch. She worked closely with Tory at right. City Hall as his chief planner. When she entered the race, did that shake things up for you guys after he didn't really have anyone you know, big names in the race before. Well, look, I know it doesn't make for great TV, but the fact is it didn't. We had a plan in place that, that was set up by some very talented people, um, which uh, represented both Liberals and Conservatives on our campaign, and, uh, and we stuck to that plan. Uh, you know, when you have a, a solid team of, uh, of, uh, of people who, who want to see the mayor uh, get, get re-elected, uh, we had a, a credible candidate. And uh, the fact is we focus on the things that matter in politics, right? Uh, you, you focus on your ground game, your organization, making sure you have uh, connections with people from right across the city. And the fact is the mayor made it easy. He, you know, it, it wasn't his first time going to Scarborough or North York and or Etobicoke when, uh, when uh, this race started. And he has a distinct advantage as the incumbent running again. How was this different from four years ago when he was up against Doug Ford and Olivia Chow? Well, look, it, it, you know, every campaign has different voter coalitions and, and different uh, uh, circumstances. Uh, the fact of the matter is, during this campaign, there were a whole slew of things that happened that, that, made, uh, that, that made the news. I don't want to rehash it, but, you know, we had uh, at one point Blaine Lastman uh, decide to come into the, uh, you know, was thinking, Forgot about, about that yeah, one. was thinking about coming to the race. So we had a candidate from the quote unquote hard right. So, uh, and, you know, we stuck to our plan. We stuck to our game plan. And we'll see in a few minutes whether, uh, whether our plan. And, uh, uh, worked. and that's right, the polls are closing uh, at 8 o'clock, so uh, we'll be seeing what happens there. I'll have more updates throughout our live stream on how this mayoral race plays out. Chris? 
Lauren, fantastic. Thanks a lot. And uh, those polls are closing in just about five minutes from now. That is when things will really get started. And the one man who is looking to see all of this more than most is John Tory himself. We can uh, take you now to where he is viewing this live himself. He's obviously surrounded by quite a few people. You can see him there. Uh, he is just in one of the hotel rooms at the Sheridan and hoping that he will be going downstairs to a very large party. And he is hoping that it will be a victory party as well. Now, another person who is hoping to have a victory party tonight in this mayoral election is Jen. Jennifer Keysmat. You've heard her name already a couple times tonight. Jennifer Keysmat is, in fact, just a few clicks down the road on Queen Street. She's having her party there, and our Lisa Shing is following that part of the story tonight. Lisa, the uh, campaign has been a long one. It's been a tough one, I bet. How are people at Jennifer Keysmat's feeling? Hey, Chris, you know, the party has actually started. I see people right there getting some booze already. Uh, the room is also starting to fill up with supporters. Uh, it's pretty early, but they're in a pretty good mood. And I don't think uh, from anyone I've spoken with that they have any illusions about uh, how this race will go later tonight. But they tell me they were just proud of the fact that they were able to start that conversation for progressive policies uh, more more progressive policies in the city of Toronto. Uh, Keysmat herself has had a lot of energy even today. Uh, she was out campaigning or getting the vote out with uh, various members of Toronto City Council who were also out. Uh, she visited campaign headquarters as well, thanking supporters and also speaking with media. And her message was largely positive, saying all she wants is the best for the city of Toronto. Now, looking back on her campaign, she did enter the race quite late, uh, right after Doug Ford announced his plans to slash the size of Toronto City Council. Uh, Keysmat started out uh, really attacking John Tory instead of maybe uh, putting out some policies that would differentiate herself uh, from her main contender and some of those bolder policies like uh, getting rid of the eastern portion of the Gardner Expressway or turning some golf courses into public parks. Uh, uh, really came out a little bit later, so some critics say uh, whether or not that lateness of uh, those announcements really gained traction with voters and whether or not uh, she was completely overshadowed by the drama over at Queen's Park and between Queen's Park and Toronto City Council. So a lot of factors uh, coming into play here, but I think one thing is for sure, uh, the sense I get is that this crowd is really positive, they're optimistic, and they say, even if Jennifer Keysmat loses tonight, at least, again, they were able to start that conversation for more progressive policies in the city of Toronto, Chris. All right, Lisa, thanks a lot. And it certainly looks like a big party there behind you at Keysmat's headquarters. So, of course, there will be a big focus tonight on the mayoral race here in Toronto. Um, but we're also going to be play paying very close attention to a lot of the council races in the city of Toronto. And a big reason why is because there are so many longtime incumbents who will be battling it out against each other. That's just one of the fallouts of the decision to go down to a 25 ward system. Here's a bit of a primer on how we got there. How did we even get to a 25 ward election in Toronto? Whatever happened to 47 wards? Yeah, that's right. After consultation and research, the city's number of wards were originally beefed up for the 2018 election, but Doug Ford did not like that. The former city councillor, mayoral candidate, and now Premier of Ontario said Toronto was a dysfunctional mess. He also said shrinking the size of government could save moolah. As the boss of the province, he technically runs the cities too. So he created legislation to match Toronto city wards to the 25 provincial ridings. Mayor John Tory accused the premier of election meddling. These guys were the councillors who stuck up for Ford, even though the majority of council fiercely opposed the premier. Over at QP, Ford's political foes called him a dictator. And it wasn't just other politicos, lots of citizens protested too. 25 means instead of roughly 60,000 people per councillor, now there would be upwards of 100,000 people per councillor. With merging wards, incumbent councillors with years of experience would go head-to-head -to, -head 
like never before. It also means each councillor would sit on more city committees and have a lot more development applications to consider. Then there was the legal fight. First, a judge sided with the city and said Ford couldn't. Premier Ford, some said, went nuclear, invoking a never-before-used-in-Ontario clause in the Charter. It's called the Notwithstanding Clause, and so many people didn't know what that was. Google searches on it spiked. Basically, it allowed Ford to pass it anyway. Spoiler, he didn't even end up needing it. Three judges trumped the first judge, and with that ruling and just one month to go until Election Day, the campaign started for real. And speaking of starting for real, it is now 8 o'clock, or just past, and the polls have closed. That means that you are about to start seeing results at the bottom of your screen, so pay close attention to those as well, and we will be referencing them and analyzing them throughout the evening. Now, I want to bring in one of our next guests. This is going to be Andrew, or, sorry, Brittany Andrew Amofa. Brittany, thanks a lot for being here tonight. And uh, Brittany, we just heard uh, kind of a primer on how we got to this 25 ward uh, system. I know you, that you have very strong thoughts on this as a political commentator with the Broadbent Institute. So what can you tell us about why you think this is such a problem for Toronto? This is a huge problem for one. This was a blatant act of interference in our local democracy and a gross misuse of provincial powers. This election was an opportunity to have diverse voices on city council, new representation, to increase the representation of racialized individuals and women. But by reducing and slashing council to 25 seats, the premier entrenched incumbency, meaning that he made it virtually impossible to have better representation on Toronto City Council and actually affected um, how... City Tor how Toronto City Council functions in general. So right now, there's a governance issue at play here. Can a 25 board council actually effectively represent a city of 2.8 million people? Also, with an on average ward population of 110,000, we don't know. So, Brittany, are there specific council races that you'll be watching for tonight? You've talked about how there were maybe some fresh faces that were shut out of the race, but are there specifics as to uh, which races you'll be watching closely tonight? Absolutely. I'm looking at Scarborough North. We have Felicia Samuel, who's running. It's an open seat, actually, and she's she has gained momentum throughout the, ra the, throughout the entire race. She was actually endorsed by the Toronto Star, so that's going to be interesting. I'm also looking at Etobicoke Lakeshore, where Amberly Moore Lee, who's a young friend, young racialized woman who's running in the race as well to possibly unseat Mark Grimes. And I'm also looking at York West. We have Tiffany Ford running against Mamaliti, and Mamaliti has been saying absolutely racist comments throughout the entire election and has been actually under scrutiny for his poor election, um, his poor voter turnout in at Toronto City Council, and actually his poor record on Toronto City Council as well. All so right, those so three you races. you are watching for a lot of different races yeah. tonight, a lot of wards, and that's exciting because we are also standing by to see these results come in. Thanks a lot for that analysis. And uh, so as I mentioned, we are going to be seeing a lot of incumbents going head to head. In fact, 11 of the council seats of those 25 are head-to-head -head battles between incumbents. That's where things get really interesting, especially when you consider this. Uh, usually when an incumbent is running, about 90% of the time that incumbent wins. The power of incumbency is huge in a municipal election. We want to highlight a couple of those head-to-head matchups. These progressive councillors both won big in 2014, and the difference maker could be an endorsement from John Tory. He's backing the Havoc over Matlow, who has become one of Tory's sharpest critics. Toronto's most controversial councillor, Giorgio Mammoliti, has, no surprise, run a controversial campaign. And this time, he's facing tough competition. Anthony Perusa has been a councillor since amalgamation and isn't shying away from a fight. Kelly's a former MP and was elected to council in 1997 and was Rob Ford's deputy mayor. Also, you don't need me to tell you, but he has a massive Twitter presence. And, oh yeah, he's the one who's friends with Drake. But Kerry Giannis has a big voice on council too and also represented his Scarborough constituents at the federal level. These left-leaning councillors are battling it out to represent the Danforth. Both won by 12,000 votes in the last election, but now it'll come down to who can get their vote out. Doug Ford's nephew is the only one to have an official endorsement from the Premier, but will it be enough? 
And does it really matter? Because Vince Crisanti is also a strong Ford supporter. All right, so those are just some of the uh, city ridings, that, or city wards, sorry, that we will be watching very closely tonight. And we also just got a bit of an update from the city of Toronto, and we know that results will start coming in at 8.15. Uh, so that means that in just about 10 minutes or so, we should start seeing quite a few of the uh, results coming through. One guy um, who's going to be paying a lot of attention to that is John Rietti. He is back in our CBC Toronto newsroom, and he has Matt Elliott with him. So, uh, John, what are you guys paying close attention to? Chris, the suspense is killing us over here. We were <laughs> frantically refreshing our phones trying to get some answers, but 8.15 is now the start. Look, we know there's going to be a lot of heartbreak on council tonight, a lot of incumbents saying goodbye that have been there for a long time. But we also know that the balance of power on city council is going to shift. And for that, I turn to Matt Elliott. He's been writing columns for us throughout the campaign, and nobody keeps a closer eye on city council than you, Matt. What does this election potentially mean for how council's big decisions are going to go in the future? Yeah, you know, with these elections, everyone tends to focus on the mayor race. It's mayor, mayor, mayor. Uh, but, I mean, aside from an office that's pretty nice and a fancy gold chain, the mayor does not have a ton of power at Toronto City Hall. Uh, the real power lies in who has a majority on council. Right now, that's dominated by councillors that are probably, you know, center-right or right, you know, on the political spectrum. Uh, we're going to watch tonight to see if some more progressive left-leading councillors get elected. If they can get close to a majority, they could make John Tory's political life uh, a little bit hard or make Jennifer Giesemat's political life a little bit easier. And that magic number, Chris, is 14. That's how many councillors you'll need to, to get something passed. So when you talk about the big issues facing this city, like uh, let's take the King Street pilot project, right? That has to come for a final vote. There will need to be at least 14 councillors in favour of keeping something that keeps the city moving. Like, I mean, how do you think that's going to go when the new city council sits down? Uh, yeah, the King Street pilot will be a, a fascinating test. So too will the Scarborough subway, you know, an issue like that did not have uh, an overwhelming support on council beforehand. Now council is going to be smaller. The balance of power could shift. So the Scarborough subway could come up for a vote. Uh, you know, do you want to spend billions of dollars on this thing or not? And uh, if new council says no, then that really just throws a wrench into everybody's plans. So uh, on transit especially, on housing, on all the issues, it's all going to come down to that number of 14. You need 14 votes to make anything happen at City Hall. Okay, Chris, we're going to get back to looking for those numbers and uh, you get back to hosting the show. All right, sounds good, guys. You stand by and we'll touch base with you again very shortly, I'm sure. So as they were just mentioning, they uh, only get one vote per councillor, but some of them have a lot bigger voices than others. And one of those loud voices is often Giorgio Mamaliti. He is battling it out against another incumbent, Anthony Peruzza, in Ward 7. And it's a third candidate there that's actually catching quite a bit of attention, especially on social media. That is Tiffany Ford. She is, in fact, the number one mentioned candidate who is not an incumbent in this city election. So that's a fascinating stat. And we have Farah Morelli, who is out with her tonight. Farah, as you're looking and uh, as, you're, as you're speaking with, with Tiffany, what is jumping out in her campaign? A lot of things. The people here that I've been speaking to are pushing for a new voice on council, one that better represents this community. They want that voice to be Tiffany Ford. Many people, of course, know her as the Toronto District School Board trustee, but she has deep roots in this community. Uh, she grew up in social housing in this ward. She continues to work with at-risk youth in this community, and she is now in this tense race against two incumbents, Anthony Peruzza, as well as Giorgio Mamaliti, and she joins me live at her viewing party here at the Suya restaurant. Uh, Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Um, you're not new to elections. You've run a number of successful campaigns as a school board trustee. Running for council is a little different. Yeah, definitely. How are you feeling tonight? You know, I feel extremely excited and ready for this to... Uh, to show that you know what the results are, it was a hard-fought campaign. You know, six months and uh, so many tribulations and trials. But I have amazing volunteers and amazing support across the city, so I'm super excited. 
When the provincial government brought in this new 25 ward system, that changed the game for everybody, including yourself. You were poised to go head to head in this election uh, against just Giorgio Mammoliti. That changed. You're now running against two incumbents. Uh, tell us about how that change impacted your campaign. Well, <laughs> it was so quick, and uh, I mean, it was really recent, right? So obviously focusing on just Ward 7, the original Ward 7, and now uh, Ward 7 and Ward 8 uh, combined is just, uh, it was quite intense, and trying to cover the ground uh, uh, was really, really difficult to do with such a short amount of time. So, uh, you know, I mean, it was back and forth with the courts, and so it was just like a, like a, permanent heartburn consistently you're just kind of like okay which one is it going to be and you know and even now it's still kind of up in the air it seems like so it's been a fiery campaign right I mean just uh, I was just looking at Twitter and some of the mentions I just saw I will endure Tory if only Tiffany Ford beats Mamo just give me that <laughs> I mean a lot of the controversy uh, that we've seen in this in this race has stemmed from some of the comments made by Georgia Mamaliti uh, over the summer uh, equating some of his the constituents or criminals who live in social housing in this ward uh, with cockroaches that blew up last week over Facebook. Uh, how challenging has it been to navigate this campaign? Well, to yeah, you're right. Like to sort of navigate all the negativity and trying to sort of just you know focus on a campaign that's really about uh, community and uh, supporting community and making sure that community is uh, uh, the the center of this campaign. But then. You know, consistently having that stigma and marginalization coming from our own counselor is uh, quite disheartening. And then having it like sort of part of my campaign and people associating me with, um, you know, his words is just, uh, it was really difficult. But we try to focus, but at times we did have to, uh, you know, fight back. Absolutely. And part of the new boundaries includes uh, the Jane Finch, the entire Jane Finch neighborhood. That is new uh, under this new ward system. You're someone who spent a lot of time in this community. Uh, what is probably one of the biggest issues that is not being dealt with at City Council that people in this community need addressed? Poverty, that's one. Um, housing, deeply affordable housing, fixing Toronto community housing, and most importantly, the young people, violence, um, you know, and the stigma. No one is changing that narrative. No one cares enough. These two incumbents don't care enough to change that narrative. And that was my, my concern and my issue. And I think hopefully we'll see the results. And I think that some people, uh, and a lot of young people especially, feel the same way. We want to change that narrative for our community, but it takes leadership, bold leadership to do that. Tiffany, best of luck to you tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Enjoy your party. Thank you. That is Tiffany Ford. She is running for the City Council seat in Ward 7. One of the things we're going to be watching tonight is how many women claim seats tonight. Of course, we have 14 women on a 44-person council tonight. There are now only 25 seats. We're going to be watching uh, that closely tonight. Tiffany Ford certainly hopes she's one of them. Chris. Great, Far. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Another thing that we are going to be watching for is the turnout in this election. When there's such a strong incumbent and when a Ford is not running for mayor, we in fact often don't have a very high turnout. Sometimes it's as low in three out of ten people that are voting. So that'll be an important storyline for us to watch. And just at the end of Farah's hit there with uh, Tiffany Ford, they were talking about how there are important issues for people and what brings them out to the polls. We've put that out on our uh, Twitter poll as well. We got a result in or an answer in on Facebook and Jennifer Bradley wrote on Facebook, bike lanes were an important issue for me. How will we all share the roads? So that is just one topic, one issue, a certainly, certainly an important issue as well, but just one that is bringing people out to the polls. And uh, we have Talia Ricci who is out at the Gladstone for us. She is also talking to people there about why they voted and civic engagement generally. Talia, what are people telling you there? Well, Chris, this is a really interesting place to be because a lot of the people who are attending tonight's election party have also been coming here weekly for a civic engagement series. I'm joined now by Zara Ibrahim. She's hosting tonight's party and has also helped to organize this series. Zara, why did you see a need for something like this in Toronto? Yeah, you know, when, when we saw all of the changes happening at the province, we started to think about if we want people to fight for the things they care about, we need to operate from a shared baseline. Um, and we 
started to see that a lot of Toronto doesn't have a basic civic literacy, so they're being expected to fight for the city councillor's jobs when they have no idea what a city councillor actually does. Um, so we wanted to create an informal civic living room where we could bring like real thinkers um, on the topics, but bring them really close to citizens so that they could ask the questions they were too embarrassed to ask in other places. So. And what's the reaction been like from some of the people who have attended? I think people have shown up deeply curious. I think we were talking a lot about how people aren't showing up and commenting. People are showing up and asking questions in service of their fellow citizens to say, let's you know, create this shared baseline by actually understanding really specific things that no one talks about and there's no other place to learn about. So people have been showing up and have been, like we've been calling it beer and notebooks, right? So it's just like they get a beer, they get out their notebooks, they get out their laptops and they're typing all night um, and they're sharing that information which has been really great. We've seen the information sort of disseminated around uh, throughout their communities. And have you noticed any like aha moments? Maybe people who came in seemed very intimidated by a topic and then ended up getting very engaged in the discussion? Yeah, we had this policy called the squeaky chicken policy where we handed out rubber chickens to the entire crowd and anytime anyone said anything that someone in the crowd didn't understand, they squeaked a chicken and said, hey, I don't understand what you mean by affordable housing. Um, and so it was really cool to see people activated by, like they might not have a specific question, but they were allowed to say, I, I hear the term affordable thrown around all the time. Specifically, what does it mean for me and here's who I am? Um, and so those were more the aha moments when people realized that they were just allowed to ask like that really simple question about like I don't even understand the language that we're talking about let alone the issue. That's great. Thanks Zara. That's Zara, Zara Ibrahim. She's hosting tonight's party. Chris will keep the conversation going here and online. I'll throw it back to you. All right, Talia, thanks a lot. And speaking of that conversation online, we will be posting some Twitter polls throughout the night that we want you to weigh in on. One of those was the simple question, did you vote? And an overwhelming number of our uh, viewers tonight who are paying attention to this broadcast on all of our various social platforms certainly are paying attention. According to our online Twitter poll, we have more than 1,000 votes so far in that poll. 82%, an overwhelming uh, victory saying that they voted. So wouldn't it be nice if that was the real thing out in society as well? Um, our next guest I want to bring in right now is Elamine Abdel Mahmoud. He is with BuzzFeed News. And uh, you spend a lot of your time online, obviously, with the discussion as it plays out. And we were talking earlier with Twitter Canada, Elamine, and they were saying how many times John Tory gets mentioned. So I know that you can weigh in on that. Why do you think he's getting mentioned so many times? I mean, honestly, to me, it reads like the big big issue in this, uh, in this entire election has been uh, the, the Ontario government's decision to cut down the wards. Um, and so uh, it's really hard for an incumbent to just, um, it's really hard for an incumbent to lose any kind of steam that they get, you know, in this particular election. Um, so you see someone like Jennifer Tiesma trying to break into the conversation. I think the biggest sort of break she had in the online conversation uh, was when she tweeted secession right after uh, Premier Ford said that he would be cutting down the number of wards in Toronto. Um, so it's really hard for an incumbent to just lose the attention that they already have. Um, and there are no they divisive, any kind, any kind of divisive issues on the table. All right, Elamine, thank you very much. Yeah. We'll check in with you in just a few minutes. Cool. And uh, right now, as I mentioned, we are waiting for results for the city of Toronto. They'd mentioned that they would have those out to us at 8.15. It's now 8.17 by my watch, so we should be expecting those to start showing up any minute now. Brampton, though, is starting to release some numbers, and we already have some analysis around them. It sounds like Patrick Brown is already off to a decent start out there in Brampton. And we have our Nick Boisvert, who's watching watching that race for us very closely. Hey Nick, how are things going where you are? Hey Chris, uh, pretty good and you know, uh, as you said, uh, those results are starting to come in and it's looking to be a, uh, an extremely close race uh, for my money. Maybe I'm a little bit uh, biased since I've been covering uh, this Brampton election. This is probably the most intriguing, contentious election for mayor at least happening uh, perhaps anywhere in the GTA and right now it looks to be neck and neck between Patrick Brown and the incumbent mayor here, Linda Jeffrey. And this campaign uh, has been uh, extremely divisive, nasty at times. Uh, Linda Jeffrey has accused Patrick Brown of, of 
really just being a, a political opportunist coming here to this community and trying to run for mayor after, of course, he was forced to resign as leader of the, the PC party just earlier this year. Uh, he's accused her of being an ineffective leader uh, and uh, contributing to issues in this city uh, like crime, rising property taxes, things like that. So a lot of uh, accusations, a lot of um, uh, online even um, uh, bickering uh, back and forth between those two camps as well as some outside uh, political uh, sort of entities as well. So this has been a really interesting uh, and, and very, as I said, divisive race. And we're starting to get some results. And it looks like it's uh, really going to come right down to the wire here tonight. All right, Nick, thanks a lot. Lots to watch out there in Brampton as we knew it would be a nail biter. And that is how it looks like it is shaping up there. Now, here in Toronto, we did not expect a nail biter. And you can see at the bottom of your screen, that is certainly what we are experiencing right now with 80% of the polls reporting so far. John Tory with an astounding lead there of 63% support. Jennifer Keysmat down around 23%. That would be a disappointing finish for her with that low of a number. But John Tory around 63%. That would be a huge number for him, well more than he got in 2014 with around 40 percent of the vote. Let's bring Lauren Pelly back in now. Hey, Lauren, I'm sure people in that room are starting to see these numbers as we are. How are they reacting? Well, it was a brief chant there, if you caught it, of Tory, 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 as those numbers started showing up on the TV screens here. 63%, uh, uh, as you said, so far. So right now, Tory's on the ground. It's probably feeling quite relaxed. We caught a glimpse of him sitting on the couch holding hands with his wife, Barbara Hackett, uh, looking quite composed. But here there's a, an air of anticipation. If he did wind up with around 63% of the vote, that would put him on track to be quite similar to David Miller's second term, where he landed around 65 percent of the vote uh, when he became mayor for a second term. Uh, now, it would be quite different, however. The, the record since amalgamation was uh, last minute. His second term, he landed 80 percent of the vote. So with Tory potentially uh, being re-elected as mayor, it'll be interesting to see just how much of the vote he's able to grab. Uh, Keysmat, Jennifer Keysmat was, uh, you know, quite, quite steady in the polls, around 30 percent through the race. You know, is she going to stay at that level or we're going to see her drop off significantly. All of that will be quite interesting to see. But, you know, as Tory, you know, it looks to be poised for potentially a second term. We'll be staying tuned on how these results play out. Back to you. Lauren, thanks. And this is a very important moment in this broadcast. CBC News is ready to make a projection to make a call. All right, so, and with about 80% of the polls reporting and an astounding lead, we can now say that John Tory is projected to be the next mayor of the city of Toronto. This is certainly not going to be of much surprise to a lot of people, though, of course, it is a very important uh, announcement to be making. But CBC has seen enough of the results to, to uh, confidently say that John Tory is set to be the next mayor of the city of Toronto. First First elected back in 2014 and never really stopped campaigning after that in his time in office. It will be interesting to see how he handles things now that we can tell you that he is heading back to City Hall to uh, be the mayor of the city of Toronto once again. We also will, of course, be checking back in with his campaign headquarters when we can, because we'll want to see how that party evolves over the course of the night. And as I was mentioning earlier, the mayoral race may have looked like a bit of a foregone conclusion. And when we look at the numbers tonight, with around 63% of the support, that's certainly not a record-breaking number, as you heard Lauren saying, but it's definitely Definitely a big win for John Tory and one that he will be very happy with. Now, Jennifer Keysmat, on the other hand, you can see her vote sort of collapsed there with only around 23% support. She will not be very happy with that result tonight necessarily, especially because she had been polling around 30% support throughout this campaign. So not even able to uh, reach that point tonight. But John Tory, as I've been saying, around 63% support. And while we figure out exactly 
exactly where we're going to go next in our coverage. I just want to read out to you one uh, tweet that we just got from someone. It says from At Wonders, more support to stop the root causes of guns and gang violence, poverty, isolation, racism, trauma, and lack of affordable housing, mentorships, decent jobs, community space, education, etc. So that was in response to our Twitter poll, obviously, which was what brought you out to vote. And it sounds like almost everything brought that uh, Twitter user out to vote. Uh, but it, at least he did vote. And uh, so as we've been talking, uh, we have that Twitter poll going. We also have uh, many others uh, that we will be programming for you throughout the night. So please do engage with us. This conversation is, of course, all about you tonight. And while we're doing the conversation online, we're also out in the community talking with people as well. That's where we have our Talia Ricci. And she is tapping into that conversation with some voters there at a party at the Gladstone Hotel. So Talia, what are people saying now that we have projected that John Tory will be the next mayor of the city of Toronto? Well, Chris, after we projected that John Tory would be the next mayor of Toronto, I actually heard an eruption of applause here. I haven't had a chance to go out and talk to too many people, but I do have Jeff Muselar here. Jeff, what was your reaction when you heard this and when you saw these numbers tonight? I wasn't too surprised. Um, we did a little guess before the election what we projected the numbers would be. I said 60% for John Tory. I wasn't the closest in our group, but close enough. And so obviously your media group of friends is pretty uh, involved and informed if you guys had a little bet going. Yeah, yeah, reasonably. Um, just sort of interested in local politics, so that's what brought us out here tonight. And how did the uh, projection make you feel? Um, sort of disappointed, but not altogether surprised. And why are you disappointed? I, I personally voted for Jennifer Kismet. Um, I think she had a more progressive vision for Toronto. Um, one that I resonated more with and so disappointing to see the results. Maybe she'll run again. Um, I think I've heard that Tori's not planning on running again and so maybe that will give her a better opportunity. And what was it about Keysmat's platform that resonated with you? Um, I think like more progressive on transit. Um, I think part of my feelings were sort of formed on how they both acted when they were sort of working together. Um, Jennifer seemed to have sort of more of a view of doing like the thing that made most sense, whereas Tori was more sort of appeasing the voters. Um, the Gardner and the Scarborough subway are sort of some examples of that. And what were some of the issues in this election that you felt really strongly about? Um, I think housing affordability was an important one. Um, it's a hard problem, so I don't know that either of the candidates had great solutions to that, um, but it's something that affects everybody in the city. Um, what was another important issue? Um, I guess tr like transit's a big thing. Um, Jennifer really wanted to push for the downtown relief line as soon as possible. That's sort of the big ticket item, um, but also had good things to say about like improving busing where those improvements are required. All right, Jeff, thanks for chatting with us. Chris, I'll send that back to you. Great, Talia, thanks a lot. We will check in with you again. So he's obviously a very disappointed Keysmat supporter. We're seeing some of that reaction play out online already. Uh, one tweet just came into us a couple minutes ago from Diablo Canyon. He said, well, Toronto wasn't ready for Keysmat for mayor, so I guess it'll just have to be Keysmat for premier. It seems like a bit of a lofty prediction at this point in the night, but that's what he is saying online. So what are you saying online? What do you want uh, to have happen next? And what do you think of the result as we've been uh, reading it out to you tonight with John Tory around 63% support? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Jennifer Keysmat and her campaign did not materialize tonight. They were hoping for around 30% support. You can see that they're well below that. Maybe some long faces tonight where she is having her campaign headquarters on Queen Street and Lisa Shing is there with that part of the story. Hey, Lisa, so how are people over at Jennifer Keysmat's campaign feeling tonight now that they know that uh, she will not be going to City Hall to be Toronto's next mayor? Well, Chris, uh, you know, I'm joined by a supporter. Obviously, the numbers are not great. Uh, Richard Petty, you are a Keysmat supporter. Uh, CBC has made the call already. What do you think? Well, obviously disappointing, but, you know, 
Jennifer only had about two months to do this, competing against an incumbent who's really been campaigning for four years. I think the important thing is she got across a lot of ideas. She aspired for a lot for Toronto, and hopefully some of those ideas stick. And the mood here is pretty good, considering. What accounts for that? Well, I, she's well-liked. Um, she's a very energetic, authentic woman. These people really follow her. And I'm not surprised that, you know, typically when she hears something, everyone clears out. They're waiting to hear from Jennifer, and um, they like her. What do you think is next? For her, there have been rumors, some murmurs. Yeah, and I think what, what I've read... What do you want to see? Well, I hope she does something that she, she likes doing and she can make a contribution. She has to be mindful of her family. She's got a wonderful family. But I have no insight into it at all. When the dust settles, I'm sure uh, my wife and I will have dinner with her and Tom, and maybe I'll get some insight then. <laughs> Sounds very good. And one more question for you is, what does this mean for the city going forward, Richard? Well, I'd like to think some of it sticks to the ribs. I mean, 23%, that's going to probably translate into about 200,000 votes. A lot of young people, diverse people, a lot of women, and I hope that they remember these ideas and they hold the mayor's feet to the fire and, and make it part of his legacy. Thanks so much. There you have it, Chris. A really positive uh, a spirit coming from these uh, Jennifer Keys Matt supporters. We are expected to hear from her shortly to see what she says, so we'll stand by for that. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of her supporters were realistic throughout this campaign, knowing that she was coming from way behind to try to battle against absolutely. a pretty popular mayor in Toronto, John Tory. So um, probably not too surprised with tonight's result, but they will absolutely be uh, hanging on her every word, and so will we all. We, of course, will be bringing Jennifer Keysmat's speech to you live as soon as she steps up to that podium so stick with us throughout this special broadcast on all of our various platforms and continue to weigh in please as well now as i mentioned earlier the mayoral race in toronto is an important one to watch but in this specific election we are focused so much on those tight council races where we have goliaths up against other goliaths and the drama is high. I know that John Rietti and Matt Elliott are paying close attention to all of those tight races. What are you guys noticing now? Chris, we thought these races would be close and we were absolutely right. There are some real serious nail biters out there. Let's start by going to the ward that Farah was in, Humber River, Black Creek. Anthony Peruzza has a commanding lead at this point over Giorgio Mammoliti. This is, this is, uh, well, Matt, yeah. what do you think? Uh, Giorgio Mammoliti, uh, what word to describe Giorgio Mammoliti? Notorious, controversial, uh, weird. Uh, Giorgio Mammoliti has a checkered history as a councillor. To see him down uh, by 2,000 votes, that's going to make a lot of progressive uh, organizations in the city very, very, very happy. Uh, if that holds and Anthony Peruzza is the winner tonight, that's sort of going to be the end of an era. Uh, Giorgio Mammoliti no longer on city council. Uh, not called yet, but we'll see. The next one was close, but it is not close anymore. Let's go to Eglinton Lawrence, where Mike Cole has been, pro we're projecting Mike Cole now to take down Kristen Carmichael Greb. What yeah. do you think? Uh, again, not really a surprise. Mike Cole is interesting. His son, Josh Cole, was on council. Uh, Josh Cole announced his retirement, and then Mike Cole announced he was uh, going to step in. Usually it goes the other way around, father to a son, uh, parent to a child, but we're seeing the reversal here. But uh, Mike Cole obviously still has a brand in the area. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what he does on his return to council. It's a family affair. Let's That's go right. to Don Valley West. We have Jay Robinson holding a lead over John Burnside. We've seen this one flip back and forth a number of times. What do you think of this matchup? Uh, this is close. Uh, thought it might be a little bit closer, actually. Uh, Jay Robinson is heavily involved in the Public Works Committee. She's the chair of that committee. Uh, she's been the point person on the road safety plan, which has proven a little bit controversial. Uh, you know, some people are arguing that she hasn't done enough for road safety. Some people have argued that, you know, she's doing what she can. Uh, that was a big issue. Uh, but at the same time, she's looking pretty good so far. Now let's go to one of the wards that we've really been watching closely, Beaches East York. Brad Bradford wow. holds a slim, <laughs> slim <laughs> I don't even close. know if we should call it a slim lead. He, he's leading, yeah. but it could change in a heartbeat. Yeah, this, this is one of those things where as people say, you know, why should I bother voting? One vote doesn't make a difference. There you go. One there you vote go. is going to make a difference there tonight. Uh, Brad Bradford, uh, that's his real name, I am told. Uh, is that is Brian, his real name. That's his real name. <laughs> 
uh, running against uh, Matthew Kelway, who was an NDP MP. Uh, lots of name recognition for Kelway. Brad Bradford does have Mayor Tory's, uh, re-elected Mayor Tory's endorsement, so we're seeing how that plays. And let's quickly go to another key ally of Mayor John Tory. His budget chief, Gary Crawford, has a very slim lead as well in Scarborough Southwest. What do you think about that? Yeah, both of these candidates are allies with the newly re-elected Mayor John Tory. Uh, Gary Crawford is the budget chief, so I think John Tory is counting on him pulling it off. Uh, we'll see what happens. Now, Chris, if you're looking for the full set of results, we actually have already uh, 12, make that 13 people elected. So if you want or projected to win, you can go to our website for all those. Great, okay, and I know that there's gonna be a lot of analysis in addition to those results, but right now we wanna take you live to Jennifer Kiesmat, who is speaking about her loss tonight. Let's listen in. Thank you to all of you that voted for me in this election. I am deeply humbled by your confidence. And thank you to all the people of Toronto for the spirit of community that we all share, for the dreams that we have as a city, and for the amazing energy that we all bring to this wonderful city of ours. And finally, thank you to my husband Tom and my children, and also my family and my amazing friends for supporting me on this wild and wonderful ride over the course of this campaign. I want to sincerely congratulate John Tory on his victory. Mr. Tory has worked hard his whole life in political office, and I'm sure that our mayor will return to office determined to make his time there count. But this campaign is over. The vote is in. It falls to all of us to wish him every success as he proceeds to govern. I think I know what this city will be working on in the years to come. You know how I know? There are issues that I heard about in every corner of this city during the campaign. We'll be working to make housing more affordable for ordinary families by building more of it. We'll be working. We'll be working to make our transit system better by continuously building to a plan that makes sense. And we'll be working in this city to make our streets safer. And eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later, we'll get around to getting rid of chunks of that monstrosity of 1950s infrastructure. Because we know that it scars our city and we could have a beautiful waterfront instead. We really could. We'll also eventually pay for the city services with a tax system that's fair and ask people to contribute their fair share to ensure that there's a place for absolutely everyone in this city. And we'll eventually think of ways to ensure that everyone can afford to live here with ideas like a real rent-to-own program in this city.
We'll work on these things because we know they're what we need in our city, but we also know that they're what the people of Toronto want. We've always been a place where you can arrive with just your suitcase and 200 bucks from anywhere and build a life in this city. And we want to continue to hold on to that moving forward. I'm proud. <laughs> I'm very proud that you and I, in this campaign, we showed that all of that is possible, because it really is. I'm not going to give up working on it, and I hope you don't give up either. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you. All right, and a big thumbs up there from Jennifer Keysmat at the end of her concession speech. Uh, she was all smiles. She was very upbeat as well. Uh, certainly seemed to be gracious in this defeat tonight. She also thanked uh, her supporters, her family as well, and she certainly wished the next mayor, John Tory, well as he takes over things again at City Hall. And uh, she also talked about all of those issues that she had put forward during the campaign, and she mentioned how she was going to continue to try to hold the people who will be going to City Hall to account. We had our Lisa Shing also following, uh, following along while Jennifer Keysmat was speaking. And Lisa, what stuck out to you while, while we heard from Keysmat for the first time there? Well, Chris, the fact that there is so much energy in this room, and keep in mind, it was a concession speech, so the supporters really came together, uh, cheering her on, chanting her name, as you heard just there. Uh, really, it seems to be an adoring crowd who seemed to really believe in Jennifer Keysmat's vision for the city. You heard in her speech as well that she will continue fighting for that vision and centered around uh, creating an affordable city. So that does leave the question, though, as to what comes next. How is she going to uh, try and achieve that vision? So we are waiting for one-on-one -on -one interviews with Jennifer right now, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to ask her some of those questions as to what comes next, what she's going to do uh, in just a few minutes, Chris. But this crowd doesn't seem to be dispersing. Uh, they're still heading to the bar and getting drinks and and, uh, and chatting among themselves as well. But clearly, they knew what was going to happen tonight, but still, their enthusiasm didn't let up. All right, Lisa, thanks so much. It, it wasn't a victory party for Jennifer Keysmat, but it sure looks like one behind you. We appreciate this very much. Now, we also want to take you now to Lauren Pelly, who is over uh, just a few blocks down on Queen Street, and she is with John Tory, really the man of the night, with quite an astounding uh, victory tonight at 63%. That is well more than he was elected with in 2014. And Lauren, something that's very interesting is the fact that John Tory said all along that he only wanted to have two terms in office as mayor of the city of Toronto. So I'm curious, as you've been working the room and talking with folks over there, how do they think he will change his style, if at all, now that he's been re-elected to a second term? Well, for Tory, it's very much been about keeping the status quo. It's been, you know, doing what he said he would do and, and, and keeping doing that. Uh, his family actually is just on stage behind me right now. Martin, if you can swoop over there a little bit and show them his family. Uh, they've just arrived. Uh, these are Tory's children and other family members here. You know, and this, this is a mayor who really, uh, you know, made it clear that he had uh, goals in mind for this election. He wanted to focus again on transit, uh, getting the relief line up and running, getting Smart Track up and running, uh, as well as building on the affordable housing file. But a lot of it was really building on his work over the past four years. Now, he's got some family members that are actually talking on stage right now. We can let you take a look at that if you guys would like. Chris, would you like to uh, listen in for a bit? 
Toronto's amazing mayor. We are so proud and honored to be standing here today for this great occasion. As many of you know, we are John and Barbara's children, and in order of importance, I'm Susan. <laughs> we have Chris and George behind us, and this is John. Always last. They gave us three minutes to make this introduction, and just like our dad taught us, if they give you three minutes to speak, you should take at least 15. <laughs> like so many, we're just so relieved that this campaign is finally over. Do you know what it's like for children to see their dad on TV every night? And what's worse, to see him at all those festivals dancing? <laughs> dad, we love you, but your lack of rhythm is terrifying. <laughs> Thankfully, not hereditary. And like, thank God he won. I mean, what would he do with all the spare time if he lost? Maybe he could open a dog spa. Or become an, an Instagram, Instagram influencer. influencer. Oh yeah, uh, that's possible. Well, fortunately for him, and most fortunately for the people of Toronto, we are gifted with four more years of leadership that works. To say that we are proud of our father is an incredible understatement. Needless to say, he's had a few different careers under his belt, but I think we can all agree that we've never seen him so proud and so happy as when he is serving the people of Toronto. Us siblings have been so lucky to grow up with exceptional people as parents and role models. Uh, many of you in this room have met and interacted with and experienced the force of life that is our mother, Barbara. She is and always has been our dad's greatest supporter and occasionally, of course, supplying some of the most uh, constructive criticism. In fact, uh, this year our parents celebrated 40 years of marriage. Aww. And what better anniversary present than an election campaign, am I right? So thank you to her, to our mother, for putting up with all of our dad's crazy political shenanigans. Yes. Yeah. And lastly and most importantly, none of this would have been possible without the support of the people of Toronto and every single person in this room. It's, uh, yeah. It's one thing for us to be fans and supporters of our fathers, and it, it would probably be pretty awkward if we weren't. Uh, but it really is, as his family, inspiring to see people from all across the city, from all walks of life, from all origins, come together and work so hard to help him and them succeed. We thank again each and every person who helped with the campaign, volunteering and voting to allow our father to continue doing what he is so proud and so honored to do, which is to represent you as the mayor of Toronto. So, enough from us. Let's hear from the man himself, the man who makes us call him your worship. Please welcome our dad and your mayor, John Tory.
Well, that's quite an evening, isn't it? Now, I want to start off by telling you something you know would be obvious, which is that I love my kids, but after that introduction, I'm going to miss them, but I'm still going to love them. I want to begin by saying thank you, and I want to say thank you first to Toronto, because uh, they've given me uh, a mandate and they've allowed me to continue to serve in this job, which is such a privilege. And I want to say thank you to the people of Toronto for their confidence, uh, for their support, uh, for their inspiration, and for this historic mandate that they've given me tonight. And I want to thank my opponents in this campaign. You know, it's not an easy thing to do to put your name on a ballot. It takes courage, it takes a lot of endurance to run a race this long, uh, and ultimately it takes a lot of faith in democracy and a belief that in our system of government you can do something, you can make a difference. And I want to thank all of those who ran, and in particular, I want to acknowledge Jennifer Kiesmat, who finished second and who brought ideas forward, which I'm sure we will discuss in the coming days. And of course, I want to congratulate those who won seats on Toronto City Council tonight. I look forward to working with each and every one of them to make a great city even better. So my thanks as well go to, uh, and congratulations go to those who didn't win tonight. Uh, your caring for our city is evident, especially those who have served on council and whose service ended tonight, at least in part because of the reduction in the number of wards. So let's give them a round of applause. Now, you were all part of a great team, and I thank you so much, and I want to thank the campaign team, especially my co-chairs, Vic Gupta and Vince Gasparo, and my campaign manager, Luke Robertson. You better watch out. He might be running for something at that kind of thing. The uh, communications team of Kirthana Kamalsavan and Courtney Glenn, and through them, the entire team, that uh, many of them still out across the city on the, on the, doing the superb job they did on election day today. I want to thank you for your professionalism, for your amazing hard work, and above all, for your friendship, because it is something where we become friends in, this, uh, in these kinds of joint endeavors we undertake together, because this historic win belongs to you as much as it does to me. And I just want you to know, out of deference to the whole result and how great it is, uh, and especially to the team, I am pushing back the start time for the morning staff meeting to 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, 8.30. I want to thank the volunteers, hundreds of them, and they're out across the city tonight. They couldn't all get back here when the time the polls closed. But I want them to know that their hard work and their determination means a lot to me. It means the world to me. And finally, of course, uh, my family, my kids, who I do love, notwithstanding uh, some of those comments that they made. My mother is here, my brother. Uh, in fact, several of my brothers have, have helped, my sister. Uh, and above all, thank you to Barb because she, as the kids said, they're right about this, she's put up with a lot, uh, with all of what they described as my political shenanigans, but in the end, uh, she means everything to me and she has put up more than any one person should ever have to put up with. Where did she go? She was over there somewhere. So thank you, Barb. Now some of you will have heard me say during the campaign that I was in North Etobicoke meeting with some moms from the Somali community. They were telling me that their kids who did everything they were told. They're amazing. They did all the right things. They, they got a great education. They made good choices. And yet they're having a hard time connecting to the, the jobs and the opportunity that we know exists elsewhere in the city. Where we were sitting that day in Rexdale, we could see the CN Tower off in the distance, way off in the distance. All the great things happening in our city seemed quite far away. It might as well, in some respects, have been happening on the moon. I thought about those moms a lot over the last few weeks. And it seems to me that job one over the next few years is to continue the work of connecting Toronto up in many different ways. To bring opportunities closer, to bring people closer, to bring us closer to our ultimate goal, which is a truly great 21st century city, a livable, affordable city with opportunities for everybody. A place, a place where no neighborhoods are left out, where no groups of people are left out. We've done a lot to bring those opportunities closer. We've attracted the likes of Shopify and Intel and Microsoft and Google and Uber, building on the incredible community of entrepreneurs and startups who are actually here first. We've got 70,000 smart, ambitious people every year coming here to pursue their dreams. We're generating billions in revenue for the province of Ontario. We're connecting our disparate and diverse neighborhoods together like never before. We are physically connecting people 
to opportunity. Six new subway stops on the Spadina line. The Crosstown finally nearing completion. Real work being done to build Smart Track. And for the first time, real solid work on the relief line. These are things that are getting done. And they're going to connect people. We are doing more to connect young people to opportunity through our youth employment strategy. And I have made a specific pledge, an important one, to bring the rate of youth unemployment down much further. We are doing more to attract the attention of the world through film and television and tech and financial services and the arts, all areas where we excel and where others now look to us from around the world as global leaders. And we have done all of this while keeping a lid on taxes, something which directly addresses the affordability issue confronting many Torontonians. I've heard the message loud and clear that we must do more to speed up the increase in the supply of affordable housing so people from every single income group will be able to live here and work here in our great city of Toronto. And that speed up on the supply of affordable housing is exactly what we're going to do. Une ville affordable et juste à Toronto a besoin d'un travail plus rapide sur le logement affordable et la mise en réseau de plus de personnes. C'est exactement que nous allons faire. <laughs> building on the foundations, building on the foundations of the last four years, over the next four years, my goal is to make sure that no one anywhere in our city feels like opportunity is a distant point on the horizon. We must continue to be a city that is a place of hope for everyone, not a place where people lose hope. Woo! So after a brief rest, I am ready to get back to work with the council. In fact, I never stopped working, and I'm going to get back to work with the new council, with the other governments, with the people to get things done. Because, because we are just getting started in getting this city moving and, and getting it connected and bringing opportunities closer to home. And we also have a duty, quite frankly, to being, bring people closer to each other. I've met with moms and dads and families affected by the recent gun violence. And I know I've witnessed two things to be true. One, that we need to do more to tackle the causes and the consequences of gun violence in this city. And I'll be making a renewed and very determined effort in that regard. And two, I've learned this truth as well. No child comes into this world wanting to hurt others, to engage in violent criminal activity. No child at all. Yes, we need stricter laws and we must support our police, but we also have to invest in kids and families and neighborhoods right across this city. Through job fairs, through mentorships, through recreational opportunities, arts, sports, music, parks, through all the means that we have at our disposal as a city to break down, to break down the barriers that divide and build our people up, all of them without exception. And that also means, I should tell you, because this is going to be something I'm going to focus on, as you've heard me say, it also means tackling mental health and addiction. Yep. Plain and simple, plain and simple, my friends, this is a crisis. It is a crisis in our city affecting way too many Torontonians. And it is morally and practically wrong for us not to do much more together to meaningfully address it. Bringing a, a city closer together also means saying categorically and forcefully and as strong and as often as we need to that those who sow division, the racists and the peddlers of hate, they have no place in this city and they never will have a place here. On this, on this and other matters, I make no apology for the fact that I believe building up this city, bringing people together, changing hearts and minds on issues, including discrimination, that change will not come from attacks on each other. All of these challenges require us to harness every single bit of talent that we have in business, academia, labor, nonprofit sector, and street by street across this wonderful city. It requires leadership from government. Yes, it does, which I can assure you that I will provide. It requires better and more productive partnerships with the other governments, partnerships which I am committed to strengthening. Ultimately, it falls to each and every one of us, not just leaders in government, not just governments themselves, not just nonprofits, every single person to say, how can I help? How can I build? How can I do my part to make sure this city really comes together? A livable, affordable, 
opportunity-filled cities that con city that continues to be the envy of the world. My friends, I think we are closer to that city today than we were four years ago. I think we can all feel that. Things are better. Things are improving. But there is much, much more to do on transit, on affordable housing, on access to opportunity, on building up and, in some cases, restoring trust that has been lost. People have made it clear they want to see their governments work together to bring on these changes now, not on some distant day in some other administration. Now, as quickly as we possibly can, because the people of our city have waited long enough for the transit that we lack. They've waited long enough for the parks and the playgrounds that our kids deserve. They've waited long enough for the affordable housing that we need and for the quality of life that we all seek to be enhanced even further. And the people of Toronto have told me they want to get things done. They want us to get things done all in the cause of keeping this one of the world's most livable cities, a place where for all the turmoil in the rest of the world, for the, all the turmoil in the rest of the world, we remain a place of hope and a place of example. And so I say, not just to my own staff, that 8 o'clock meeting is coming soon, but I say to city councillors, I say to city staff, I say to my friends in business, my friends in labour and the nonprofit sector and other levels of government, let's get to it. Let's get at it. I'm going to be calling on absolutely everyone. Together, I think we can get things built. We can tear down barriers. We can make sure that this city reaches its full potential. And at its core, that means opportunity for everyone without exception. It means that that opportunity must be closer than it has ever been before for everyone without exception. And I believe, my friends, I believe in my heart that with competence, with collegiality, with compassion and a huge amount of love, which I have and I know you do for our wonderful, wonderful city, that we can together get on with getting back to work for you, which I certainly look forward to doing. And I thank you for giving me such a strong mandate to do so. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Celebrate tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. A strong mandate indeed for John Tory. He started that speech, that victory speech, by saying that it had been quite an evening, and absolutely it has. 63% of the support of the citizens of Toronto who voted, that is quite a large victory. Um, it wasn't necessarily a surprise when we saw what we were dealing with in the last few days of this campaign, certainly, but definitely one that the mayor is elated with tonight and possibly bigger than a lot of people were expecting. You heard him talking there quite a bit about his own record and talking about his successes. He mentioned a few times how much work he does. He said he never stopped working, and that is something that we've heard a lot of times from his supporters, his staffers as well, that endurance that he has as not just a politician, but also as a campaigner. Obviously, he is very seasoned. He's been at this for a very long time. And tonight, he is celebrating just a huge victory in the city of Toronto. So we're also seeing this conversation uh, play out online, of course, as we are here anchored out of Twitter headquarters. And we're watching very closely what you are saying as we broadcast on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube as well, and on our website. So please continue to chime in join in that conversation. And I want to bring in Julia Whalen again, because Julia has been tracking what you've been saying in response to some of our questions as well. So Julia, what are you noticing now that John Tory has won this very large victory? Well, Chris, uh, interesting to note that uh, the Twitter trending list, a lot of them are uh, simply uh, hashtag Toronto votes, hashtag city vote. But John Tory has 5,219 tweets, so he is trending right now. Jennifer Keysmat not trending, but Mayor of Toronto is trending, as is Giorgio Mammoliti. We also have some tr tweets coming in uh, in support of Tory. Miguel Santos on Twitter says, we want to keep at John Tory in office to continue to look out for Toronto. Nurse Backpacker said, so happy to hear of John Tory winning again. You have my support 100%. John, congratulations. 
And on Facebook, Christina Felinar says, I trust he'll be able to make Toronto safe again because the crisis is going on and on. So lots of comments that we're getting on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We are paying attention to all of them. So make sure uh, that you keep tuning in and uh, keep the questions and comments coming. All right, Julia, and they will continue tonight and continue for the weeks and days ahead, I'm sure. Thanks a lot for this. And uh, of course, we've mentioned a few times that this is quite a big mandate for John Tory as he heads back to City Hall as the mayor of the city of Toronto. But really what matters most in a city like, like Toronto is who is with him, who is by his side in those council chambers, because not everybody is going to agree with him. And that is going to perhaps be a bit of a challenge for John Tory. He does have a big mandate, but can he get his initiatives done? Lauren Pelly is uh, going to join us again now. Lauren, you know this uh, mayor quite well. You've, you've followed him at City Hall. What is he going to be able to do with this uh, mandate tonight? Well, he certainly wants to do a lot, and we heard that in his speech tonight, that he was talking about transit, getting the relief line up and running, and more transit built in the city. Uh, he, he's made a strong case for building more affordable housing. One promise of his on the campaign trail was 40,000 units of that over 12 years. These are bold things that he's hoping to do without raising property taxes. Now, of course, as you said, he will need those supporters on city council. He is just one vote. And there are many challenges that, that lie ahead in achieving a lot of these things. The city only hit its affordable target, affordable housing target, I should say, for the first time last year. So getting more of that built obviously is a bit of a daunting task, a necessary one, many would say, but, but one that uh, will be quite daunting for the mayor. Uh, now, on, you know, people are saying here tonight that they're, they're thrilled that he's been re-elected, but he's going to also have to contend with, uh, on the transit file, Premier Doug Ford, who has pledged to upload the TTC subway system to the province. So there's a lot that's going to be on the mayor's plate. He has bold ideas. He wants to make Toronto the envy of the world, and he feels that he can get the city there. But that won't come necessarily easily in Victoria over the next four years. Chris? All right, Thor uh, Lauren, thanks a lot for this. I appreciate it. And uh, another interesting discussion point for us tonight is turnout. We're always looking at that when we're discussing all of these things, whether it's online or when we're out in the community speaking with people as well. And what we've seen is that when a Ford is not in the race for mayor, the, uh, the actual voter turnout is, in fact, lower than 40%. We saw that in 2010. It was well over when Rob Ford was running for mayor around 50% in 2014 when Doug Ford was on the ballot it was about 60% and uh, so never has a voter turnout been over 40% since amalgamation when a Ford is not running an interesting point that we've noticed at CBC is that tonight we could break that because as you know a Ford is not in uh, the race to be mayor but with 92% of the polls reporting the unofficial turnout so far is around 40% so it could in fact be a bit historic on that front but obviously we've uh, been seeing that mayor john tory has gotten 63 percent already of the vote as it's come in which is just an astounding victory so far but it's going to matter most who he is with at city hall and john rietti and matt elliott are following that part of the story for us tonight hey guys what are you noticing about who is going to be at tory's side are they friends or foes well, Chris, to be fair, a Ford did mess with this election, so maybe that's why the voter turnout is, is what <laughs> he, it is. He made an appearance. He made, yeah, a cameo, a cameo. if you will. Yeah, that, that got people riled up. Uh, look, let's, let's get to the races where every vote matters, and let's go first to Beaches East York. Brad Bradford, one of the guys that Mayor John Tory supported in this race, is leading in Beaches East York. He's holding on to that lead. Can he do it? Yeah, about uh, 200, 300 votes. It's very, very, very close in Beaches East York. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see how this one shapes out. Uh, some will see this as a sign that John Tory's endorsement goes a long way. Sorry, Chris, there's some uh, drilling going on in the broadcast center <laughs> behind us, but that's okay. It's just an election. It's fine. Yeah, it's Let's go matter. to York Center really quickly. Here's another close one. James Pasternak has a slim lead over Maria Ajumeri. Yeah, a bit more daylight between these two candidates. Uh, James Pasternak is more on the sort of right side of the political spectrum. Ajumeri is an OG councillor, goes way back to the beginning of amalgamation. Uh, her losing tonight would be uh, the end of, uh, you know, a, a long time in office up there uh, in North York. Uh, so, you yeah, know, and a big victory for James Pasternak. 
Let's get to a decision. Norm Kelly at Norm has 746,000 Twitter followers and got less than 10,000 votes tonight. He has lost to Jim Karagiannis, according to our projection. I, for one, am shocked that you know having lots of followers on Twitter and tweeting about pop culture does not translate into electoral success. Uh, this is one for the political science classes to go over and figure out just what went wrong. And finally, let's go to a surprise over in Scarborough Rouge Park, where Jennifer McKelvey has a slim lead over Nathan Shan, who is the incumbent in this race. Yeah, this is an interesting race. Both candidates have a history of, of running for office uh, unsuccessfully. Nathan Shan finally got into council uh, via a by-election a couple of years ago. Uh, now it looks like he may be on his way out already. Politics is cruel. So look, Chris, we've been kind of crunching the numbers and, and it, there's a lot of wild cards out there. But for right now, we think that Tory probably still has control over this council. Yeah. My question to you, Matt, is will he govern differently, given that this is his second term? He's probably not going to run for re-election. Will we see a different John Tory? I think we will have to see a different John Tory. Like you said, I, I sort of feel like the balance of power between the left and the right is going to end up being about the same as it was. Uh, you know, Tory's uh, main opposition in the downtown left, councillors like Gord, uh, Gord Perks, Joe Cressy, they're still around. Josh Matlow is still around. He's been a thorn in John Tory's side. And also there's fewer councillors now. So when it comes time to stock those committees to give out appointments, he's not going to have uh, as deep a bench to go to. So I do think he'll have to be working with some of these councillors who have been his opposition the last four years. All right, Chris, we'll be following all of this. Mr. Matt Elliott will have an analysis piece up shortly. As soon as we release him, he's going to go file that. <laughs> we will have much more coverage on CBC Toronto tomorrow, including how this council is going to work with Premier Ford's government. Absolutely. We will be talking about that for the days and weeks ahead. And you mentioned that politics is cruel, but you guys never are. Thanks a lot for that. Appreciate it. And of course, we've mentioned a few times that uh, we are hyper-focused on many of those council races here in the city of Toronto, but we're also looking outside the boundaries of the city of Toronto, looking at some of those races across the GTA. I'd like to get into some of those now. There's a theme when we look at the big picture in the GTA, and that's the fact that a lot of incumbents were heavily favored to be re-elected tonight. That's what we're seeing when we look at the projections out of Oakville. We have projected that Rob Burton will uh, take his seat back at City Hall in Oakville. Certainly not a big surprise there. And if we look at the next municipality that we have for you as well, the story is much the same. There were very few open races across the GTA. And uh, here in Vaughan with Maurizio Bevilacqua, we are seeing that uh, he just picked up an astounding amount of the vote in Vaughan. So also not necessarily a surprise there. And if we pull up the uh, next uh, municipality that we have for you, we can give you a look in Richmond Hill as well. Well, um, Dave Barrow, we have projected, will be re-elected as the incumbent mayor there in Richmond Hill. So not necessarily a surprise when you look at those municipalities. There is one wild card in the bunch, and that, of course, is Brampton. We have some major news about Brampton for you, and that is that Patrick Brown, we project, will be elected as the mayor of Brampton. This was going to be a nail-biter, we knew, and it is a close result as we see it. But CBC's decision desk is confident with the numbers that they have seen so far to declare Patrick Brown as the man who will lead the city of Brampton. We have Nick Boisvert, who is out at uh, Patrick Brown's campaign headquarters tonight. Nick, we talked to you a few minutes ago about how this was going to be a tight race. Um, I think that the people in the room where you are will be very excited with the outcome that we just uh, projected there. Yeah, that's right, Chris. I think they've had a sense uh, that it's going to be a good night for Patrick Brown for the last little while. You can hear quite a quite a loud cheer, people using their noisemakers every time the results flash across the screen. They're kind of scrolling through the Brampton uh, elections page. But yeah, this is this is huge. This is uh, perhaps uh, the next step in the comeback for Patrick Brown, the former leader of uh, Ontario's PCs, who came here to Brampton really just a few months ago, moved to the downtown uh, part of the city, signed up to run for mayor, and he has generated pretty significant support with about 44% of uh, voters casting their ballot for Patrick Brown, and obviously a uh, thousand or more people here in the room 
who have come out uh, to support somebody who, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't really here before, doesn't have uh, a lot of very firm connections to the city. He did used to work here as a lawyer, but uh, never represented Brampton at any kind of uh, political level. But he was here. He brought that very strong political ground game, that ability to get out the vote, to galvanize uh, communities here in this city, and he's, he's turned it around. He was, at this time last year, leader, as I said, of the PCs. Looked like he was perhaps going to be Ontario's next premier. Then, of course, the downfall, but now uh, looks like he is going to be Brampton's next mayor. It's going to be very interesting to see how he deals with this uh, provincial government as the uh, mayor of this city. Obviously, take a listen to that. That's not Patrick Brown, but some of the cheers uh, like I said, they already kind of know that he's going to win. But uh, managing that relationship with the uh, Ontario PCs, Premier Doug Ford, even the other parties, uh, many of whom came out in support of his challenger, the incumbent mayor, Linda Jeffrey, during this campaign. So we'll see, is it going to be Patrick Brown against the world? Is he going uh, to be able to manage that relationship with Queen's Park? Very uh, interesting questions. But for now, I guess step one for Patrick Brown is complete. He has the mayorship we are projecting, and uh, now we're just sort of waiting for him to take the stage. They've sort of cleared the runway, but uh, we're still all waiting in anticipation of Brampton's next mayor. Chris. No kidding, and there was a bit of a fake out there for a second and a half. I thought he was going to hop up on uh, stage yeah. while we were with you, but that did not happen. Um, either way, thanks a lot, Nick. Appreciate that look out of Brampton tonight. Back here in the city, we are paying very close attention to all of those council races, of course. And what is going to be so interesting is where John Tory has done well in this case, because we know that in the last vote in 2014, he didn't do well in many places like Scarborough and Etobicoke. So it'll be interesting to see as those numbers roll in where exactly uh, he did end up picking up support to go from 40% in 2014 to now an astounding victory of 63% in uh, 2018. So we want to take you now to Talia Ricci, who is out at the Gladstone Hotel, and she's speaking with someone who would probably be very happy with tonight's verdict. Well, Chris, a lot of the reaction that I'm hearing tonight at the Gladstone Hotel's election party is not surprised. But that being said, uh, certainly quite a bit of applause when John Tory was announced as Toronto's next mayor. And uh, Russell Mayu, one of those people applauding tonight. How do you feel about the results? Um, very happy about the results. Uh, it was uh, fairly anticipated, but, you know, nevertheless, really good to see. And why did you vote for Tory? Um, I voted for John Tory to uh, just stay the course uh, right now in municipal politics here in the city of Toronto. Uh, I believe that it's important that uh, a mayor has got some time to actually uh, effectively execute his agenda. So uh, that was one of the main reasons why I decided to stay with John Tory. And what are some of the mun municipal issues that are really important to you, especially as someone who you said you live downtown, correct? Uh, yes, I do live downtown. Uh, one of my main issues for me is obviously housing affordability. Uh, it's a main issue that affects a lot of millennials here in the city of Toronto. Uh, additionally, I believe uh, transit is a major issue as well, affordable transit for uh, all of the citizens here in the city. Uh, I think that the Transit City proposal proposed by John Tory was a fair, fair and reasonable proposal to try to address these concerns. Um, and additionally, his uh, considerations to reduce uh, or maintain the status quo for uh, municipal taxes, I think, is uh, very good to attract businesses here to the city. And you mentioned that, you know, giving Tory another term to get some things done. Is there anything that you'd really like to see him follow through with in the second term? Um, yeah, I would, I would certainly like to see some more um, actions with respect to... Um, um, certainly, I'd like to see more of these uh, business investments and attractions to the city of Toronto. You know, obviously, we're trying to negotiate with Sidewalk Labs right now. I think if uh, we could see that come through during his next uh, term, that would be incredible uh, in terms of uh, bringing uh, excellent opportunities to the residents here uh, to the city of Toronto and also um, just kind of following through on the transit plan in the meantime. So. That's All right, perfect. It. Thanks yeah. so much, Russell, for <laughs> speaking you. with us. Chris, we'll continue this conversation online. Back to you.
Talia, you. absolutely. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that look from the Gladstone Hotel and the party that has been building throughout the evening there. Of course, we are continuing to broadcast on all of our social media platforms and we are continuing to take your comments and your questions as well. So please pose those to us. You can put a comment on Facebook or YouTube, tweet at us as well. We really want this to be a, a conversation with you as well. But we have uh, Brittany who is here with us tonight here at Twitter headquarters. And Brittany, I know that you have some strong opinions on what John Tory can do next. What do you think he needs to tackle as he heads back to City Hall as the mayor? Mm -hmm. Well, first, Chris, I'd like to say that the results are quite unsurprising. Um, all the polls had said that John Tory was headed straight to the mayor's office. So I think it's worth having a conversation around what is his big vision for the city. We know that there are a number of things that need to be addressed in the city, such as housing, how do we get around, so transit, biking, driving, how do we make sure that people can get around efficiently in the city, but also community safety. And in regards to housing, we really need to look at how are we going to pay for the type of investments that are needed in the city. Now, John Tory he says that he wants to keep taxes low. But I don't know how feasible that is considering that we need to build and build and build in this city. Jennifer Kiesmat, although didn't have a good showing, had some ideas that are worth considering. For example, the surtax on homes that are worth $4 million or more was something that was interesting and would allow for new investments in transit projects. Brittany, so a lot of these problems that you just yes. raised about John Tory are things that we have dealt with in the city of Toronto for quite a while. These are not necessarily new problems, transit, affordability. Mm -hmm. So what do you want him to do differently once he gets into uh, power again over at City Hall? all about revenue tools. What are the tools that are at the disposal of the City of Toronto? What tools can they use to increase revenue? So we cannot keep, ha we cannot keep having a conversation around keeping taxes low. We can't keep having a conversation around where is the money going to come from? So I would love to have a serious conversation around how are we going to bring new revenue into the City of Toronto and what is the relationship going to look like between the City of Toronto and the province? Will Ford step up and work with Toronto City Council or will he try to come in and set his own agenda again like he did with this Toronto election interfering midway. So I right. think these are things that are worth considering. How are we going to do the things that Tory wants to do? Well, and it's not just Tory, of course. It's the rest of council Absolutely. as well. I, I know that you had been talking earlier about how there was a bit of a missed opportunity. We thought we might be heading towards an election with 47 wards and potentially a lot of new fresh faces. That's not going to happen. So do you think that there's any likelihood in all of these aggressive changes happening when we have a lot of the old guard heading back to City Hall? One thing that happens when incumbents return to office is that we rob the city of new ideas, a fresh perspective on how things can be done. So do I have much hope for something innovative coming out of the city council? No, I don't. Do I have much hope in terms of the representation that can be offered to a diverse city of 2.8 million? No, I don't. We have a city that has a majority of racialized people, yet we have very, from I think the numbers of racialized individuals is still hovering around 10% on Toronto City Council. That is extremely disappointing. Pointing. So what, again, I would like to see is what is it going to look like moving forward in terms of the relationship between City Council and their Premier's office? Are we going to get more of the same? Are we going to get a Premier that's going to trample right in there and set his own agenda? Or are we going to get that strong advocacy that is needed from the residents of Toronto to make sure that we have proper investments in housing and transit and we can ensure that our communities are safe? All right, Brittany, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. We've also been crunching the numbers here at CBC, and we've done a bit of a deep dive into the various wards across the city. And one thing jumped out right to us, and that's the fact that Jennifer Keysmat did not win a single ward when we were looking across the uh, entire city, which is quite a substantial thing. The fact that she wasn't able to make inroads in any single ward, um, it's perhaps reflected in the overall tally that we're seeing tonight with her support around 23. Uh, John Tory, obviously the benefactor of all of this with a huge win tonight and uh, obviously doing quite well in various parts of the city. Uh, we're also, of course, tapping into that conversation online as we've been doing all night. Julia's back with a little look at what she's noticed tonight. Julia, what's popping out? A couple of main trending items we're seeing on, uh, on Twitter, at least, Chris, is uh, Norm Kelly is tweeting. And also Patrick Brown is tweeting. So yeah, not a great night for Norm Kelly, I guess. <laughs> Twitter did not turn into a, 
electoral power for him. Exactly. So we're getting some tweets uh, that are very on brand for Norm, Norm Kelly's followers. At doglover38, Norm Kelly lost for real? <laughs> OMG. And also, maybe Norm Kelly is just a meme, but he was our meme. That's from at Heroics. Well, and I was talking to the Twitter guys earlier, and they said it wasn't even clear necessarily if a lot of those Norm Kelly supporters were here in Toronto, so wouldn't necessarily even be able to vote, as we know he has such a connection with Drake. And Exactly, and he a lot of people calling him the hashtag six dad, which he he seemed to bring off the ground uh, a little while ago. Also, Patrick Brown trending uh, in many people believe as a surprising turn of events, um, but getting mixed reaction as well. Uh, Tina Quesno LeBlanc says, "Perfect, just who I think Brampton needs." Way to go, Patrick! I'm so happy for you and for Brampton. On the other side of, of the other side of things, at To Soccer Mama says, "Hope Brampton has deep pockets." He likes to spend. So we are getting lots of reaction. Thanks so much for tuning in and for sending us your comments tonight. All right, Julia, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. So you just heard in Brampton, a bit of a split when you're hearing about the comments online and a very tight battle in Brampton. Here in the city of Toronto, that is not what we saw. We didn't expect to see a tight battle, and we didn't at the end of the day, with John Tory getting a resounding victory and heading back to City Hall as the mayor of the city of Toronto. A big night for him. He said it right off the top of his victory speech, quite a night. And uh, certainly it was for him. I also feel like this was quite a night. Thank you for being a part of our special election coverage on all of the social media platforms that we brought it on to you. And uh, also with our little vertical video experiment, hopefully it was accessible on your phone because that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted you to be able to take this wherever you needed to go, but stay connected with your city and stay connected with these results. So thank you for being a part of this night with us. We appreciate it. And we hope that you tune in at 11 o'clock as Dwight Drummond and Mike Wise are going to take a full recap of everything that has gone on throughout the course of this night, not just in the city of Toronto, but across the GTA. So tune in to CBC Television at 11 o'clock to see those two in action. That's it for us tonight, though, from Twitter headquarters. It's been a great night. Have a good one.